families are well. On behalf of the Nevik Qatar Foundation Board, welcome and thank you for joining us this evening. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to our partners and sponsors for joining us. Qatar University, Public Works Authority Ashkal, GHD, Parsons, GSonic, Erga, Turner Townsend, Qatar Financial Center, LCI, Lean Construction Institute Qatar, and TMF. Before we start, as always, I'd like to note a few points. The session is being recorded and will be available with a copy of the presentation slides next week. To receive your electronic attendance certificate, you are required to attend at least 90% of the session. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the chat box. Uh, we will have a, qu a question and answer session after, so we, we can discuss them. Um, and um, just in case uh, Dr. Nasser um, has commitments and has to leave us before he is able to answer uh, your questions, we will, uh, he will make sure that uh, the, uh, he responds for the, for these, uh, to the questions and we will send, uh, send you the answers. So, um, uh, uh, you can type your uh, questions in the chat box. Uh, also, in the chat box, if you could please provide during or after session um, feedback that you have, uh, please put plus sign for positive feedback and a delta sign for any uh, suggestion to the session that you may, uh, you may have for the improvement. Um, we appreciate your full attention during the webinar, so please stay, uh, uh, stay away from anything that may distract you. Uh, now we got to the most important part of this evening. Uh, allow me to introduce you our presenter, uh, Dr. Nasser al adba Dr. Nasser, uh, Nasser al adba is a chairman and principal lawyer at Omani Partners and associate professor at law at Qatar University. Dr. al adba is an accomplished, highly respected and well-traveled lawyer in Qatar having studied and practiced law extensively throughout the world. He specializes in drafting and review of major construction contracts and practices the field of international investment law and international trade and dispute resolution. Having recently been chosen by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Qatar for the World Trade Organization roster of panelists, WTO. He worked previously in the Public Prosecution, State Case uh, Department at Ministry of Justice and in real estate sector with Mushraib Properties. He is regularly involved in cases arising from international construction law, state and private commercial investment agreements, bilateral and multilateral international treaty negotiations and agreements, public-private partnership contracts, known as PPPs, concessions and partnership and technology transfer contracts, review and scrutiny of oil and gas agreements, DPSA and EPSA agreements. He is renowned for his skills as a commercial negotiator, mediator and arbitrator in investment arbitration and alternative dispute resolutions. Dr. Aladba holds a PhD in International Investment Arbitration, University of Manchester, UK, Diploma in International Negotiation, Mediation and Dispute Settlement, Harvard Law School in the US, Masters in International Oil and Gas from Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies, Geneva in Switzerland, and Bachelor of Qatar University Faculty of Law, State of Qatar. We are very honored and privileged to have Dr. Nasser with us this evening. And I would like to say thank you again, Dr. Nasser, for accepting our invite to be our speaker on this currently very popular topic and uh, for your support to Navic Qatar. Over to you. Thank you very much. How is the voice, Billy? Good? Good, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Billy, for this introduction. I would like uh, to thank Nawik uh, Qatar for the uh, for this opportunity. Uh, we just spoke me, uh, Billy, and Amna before the session, and I told them I am woman supportive. So I support women not just in construction but in all fields. 
uh, women are surrounding us. They are wives or uh, uh, daughters or a mother uh, who brought us to this life. So th what they need from us is a full support. It is an obligation uh, to support them. I've been uh, contacted by uh, Dr. Agada Darwish, uh, thankfully, last week. And she said, uh, I need you to uh, present us uh, the extension of time or something related to the claims, as you are uh, 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 one of the experts in Qatar. I uh, said, it will be my pleasure to do that. Um, so I thought, what topic I should choose? We have a lot of, uh, you know, experts here. Uh, experts always hungry for information. They need the new information. They don't need the information that they do, are doing every day. So it was a bit hard for me to choose the topic. So instead of one topic, I chose the three topics. Um, the topic number one is the extension of time and differences between it and the time-related cost from the contractor perspective, um, and its relationship with the uh, with which called public works uh, and tender law. This is the subject number one. Subject number two, I, I found and been advised um, uh, this year about which called a global claims in Qatar. Many of uh, uh, lawyers in Qatar, especially this is not a common law state, and uh, non, being non-common law state, um, many of those um, uh, doctrines or uh, uh, norms is not well known in, in, in our region. Uh, what does it mean, the global claim? And what is the uh, impact in the current jurisdiction? Um, and what is the uh, provisions of the current legal framework? Whether is it supporting the global claim to be submitted to the courts here or not? Um, and the third topic is the uh, construction, construction disputes in international investment law with its implications and case studies. Hopefully, I can finish all of the three topics before 7.30. Um, while I think it, is, it will be a bit hard, but I will do my best, inshallah. Um, so, we will start with the first um, slide here. What is the extension of time and time-related cost in Qatar uh, legal framework? So we need to understand the definition of extension of time and time-related cost and their relationship. The extension of time, in one hand, is a delay which couldn't be reasonably foreseen at the time of contract signing. The granting um, uh, of an extension of time relieves the contractor from liability of damages, such as liquidated damages, from the original date of contract completion for the period of the claim. So this provision is helping the contractor to waive his responsibility in paying the delay penalty. We know that the delay penalty is different from contract to contract. Some of them is giving a small percentage every day or every week uh, or every month. Some of them not. Um, in public works and in tender law, it is 1% every week. So the cap of it is 10% delay penalty, which is huge. Sometimes it will eat the um, a profit of the contractor. If you take from the contractor 10%, خلاص, finished. He has no uh, 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 much space for his own profit. Um, 
TRC in another hand means um, those costs that the contractor must incur with the passage of the time and independently from the quantum of work performed. A typical example is the cost of the workers. In fact, the workers will be paid on hourly basis and not bare quantity of the work executed. So what is the basic contractor entitlement uh, in extension of time and time-related cost in FIDIC, the employer book or which call the red book? It's obviously uh, the expert here, they know about the clause 8.4. I would say it, this is the clause where all the uh, uh, contract managers and engineers offices is putting it the top of the of the any agreement uh, before the signing with the contractor. Um, and we need also to know what is the possible grounds for the extension of time. Um, as referred before in the 8.4, we have either four or uh, four cases where constitutionally um, caused the delay referred to the Article 8.4 and it gave the grounds to the contractor to ask for extension of time to waive again the liability um, to not pay the delay penalty. Um, uh, clause uh, number 1.9 in FIDIC, which called the late information clause. Clause 2.1, the denied or late access or possession. Um, and we have seen some cases in Qatar about this. Uh, the third uh, clause, it's a clause 4.7, the errors in setting out information, it gives the right to the contractor also to ask for an extension of time. The clause 4.12 in FIDIC, adverse physical conditions, and uh, clause 4.24, the fossils. Uh, maybe some people will ask about fossils. What does that mean in 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 uh, in, uh, in FIDIC, and why FIDIC would that? If you go back to the FIDIC, you will find that the fossils, or triggers, or coins, it can uh, uh, stop the contractor from doing his work at the site. So uh, it required from the engineer to ask the uh, to uh, the employer to ask the engineer to stop the works until they save those uh, coins or fossils or uh, 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 whatever uh, found under the ground. And this is happening uh, much in Al Jiza in Egypt. Uh, there is a lot of contractors I know. Uh, they have been giving an extension of time for months, if not years, to stop the work until they get those those treasures out from the ground. Um, and also, there is a clause uh, number seven point four, which is the testing and commissioning as well. Clause eight point five, the delay caused by authorities. I can remember one case here. We have a, a client asking for advice that the authorities did not give the employer the permit license for starting the works. So it's not his mistake. He should wait and he can extend the time. Um, clause 8.9, the engineer's instruction to suspend the works, as we stated before. Also, the employer's interference with test and on completion, termination by the contractor, employer risks, force majeure, and optional termination. All of this constituting a ground to ask for extension of time. Um, also, the exceptionally adverse climatic conditions 
can stop the works. Based on that, the contractor can send a letter to the engineer and the employer asking for an extension of time until this climatic uh, 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 condition stop. Uh, also, we have unforeseeable shortages of personnel or goods caused by epidemics or governments as like COVID-19, a delay caused by the employer or a party under his control as stated before. Um, in order to eliminate this abuse or facilitate settlement of this abuse, there are now certain standards uh, we, as the lawyers, we back to, uh, to those standards, uh, which is called the delay and disruption protocol produced by the Society of Construction Law, uh, 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 or uh, we can call it the uh, leading standards of the, of the delay and disruption protocol. This is giving a set of discussions, time frames to solve any disputes between the contractor and the employer regarding the extension of time request. So um, this is a brief about the extension of time and re uh, time related cost. What is the impact or what is the legal Qatari legal framework, uh, especially uh, 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 the the the, uh, the clauses that's been stipulated in the Tinder Law Number no. 24 of 2015 and this Executive Regulation Resolution Number no. 16 of the year 2019. Um, we have a lot of requests from contractor, engineer office. Uh, about what it, my my rights as a contractor under the tender law. Tender law, we know that it is revolving around the public uh, public uh, works. Public works is the uh, the works that's been tendered and submitted uh, uh, and assigned by public entity or governmental or semi-governmental entities. Um, so I put forth uh, what is the cases for the contractor or the governmental entity to grant or ask for extension of time or time-related cost in each category. Um, uh, all right, so we will start with extending the contract period by making variation orders. In this case, the governmental entity interest in completing the contract in a satisfactory manner requires adding a period to the original contract period. And it may be for, it will be against a fee to the contracting party who is entitled to it or without a compensation, depending on the nature of the contract and its circumstances, and which is required to be executed during the additional period. Um, and this is categorized to five kind of uh, 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 contracts, four contracts, and the fifth is the conditions for the governmental entities, uh, how to take the procedures to grant the extension of time to the contractor. So the first uh, type of the contract is the contracts to provide services. So in contracts, to provide services on a periodic and regular basis, such as the cleaning, hospitality, maintenance, and etc., in which the contract term is considered one of the basic elements, for example, one year or two years, 
in which the contract term is considered one of the basic elements, the addition of a period to the original term of the contract will be a time-related cost. Means that the contractor is entitled to a compensation against this extension. And this happens in cases where the contract period is about to expire without the governmental entity completing the procedures for concluding a new contract for the same service. And in order to avoid the existence of a time lag between the end of the old contract period and the new contract without providing the services and the consequent impact on the proper functioning of the public facility. The governmental entity in this case is required to make an extension of time and changing order by adding a new period to fill the time differences between two agreements. So this is the first uh, contract, the services contract. The second one is the extension of time in general contracting and the supply of items. So as for contracting and supplies of items, the completion of the contract may be required adding work or items. And this may result to grant an extension of time to the contract period. In this case, determining whether or not the contractor is entitled to a financial compensation for that period, in addition to the fee due for additional work or item is due to the nature of the work or the item and its connection to the granted extension of time from the governmental entity. Um, the, third, the third case here is the extension of time in call of contract. And I believe if we have uh, re company representatives tonight, they will have problems in this kind of agreements with the public entities, uh, especially for non-clarity for the periods uh, in call of agreements. So the call of contracts in which a maximum a quantity is specified, the contract period may end without the governmental entity consuming the maximum of items at which, in which mentioned in the contract. And where it still needs to provide those quantities to benefit from the current price of the contract. In this case, the governmental entity may extend the contract uh, and give the contractor uh, 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 an extension of time and benefit from the prices, initial prices that they signed off uh, with the contractor. But this is going to be with one condition that the contractor will accept the terms that the entity required him to uh, uh, complete the, the new period in a call of contract. Um, so the fourth type that we have is is control control the extension of time in changing orders and this is article 81 um, so we can say that the governmental entity have uh, some limitation in granting the extension of time to the contractor and if the extension of the contract period is associated especially with time related costs then this is subject to a set of standards and control specified by article number 81 of the executive regulation on organizing tenders and auctions as follow the first the conditions and the prices during the additional period 
be the same as the conditions and the prices of the original contract. So the governmental entity subject to this condition, the condition and the prices during the additional period, it should be the same as the conditions and the prices of the original period, original, sorry, original contract. Second, the fee that the contractor is entitled to for the extension does not exceed a 20% of the contract value or the added period does not exceed a 20% of the period mentioned in the contract. And this means if the value of the agreement is, for example, 100,000, it shouldn't exceed the 20%, the should the, the, the agreement shouldn't exceed with the 20%, the 120,000. And if that agreement or contract for one year, or for example, for 10 months, it shouldn't exceed a 12 months. So this is the limitation. Also, Article 81 has provided an exemption to the to to this 20 percent. So the 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 Article 20 81 in the last paragraph gave an exemption for the legal entity to the governmental entity to exceed the 20 percent as it permits exceeding the 20 percent rate according to specific conditions. They are one, the availability of an urgent, urgency, urgency or emergency situation. Second, the contractor should approve the, 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 the percentage which is higher than the 20%. So contractor approval is a must. It's not like the 20% we spoke before as the contractor should not, uh, 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 or ha he, has, he has no right to object on the 20% either up or down. In this case, it's different. The contractor should give his approval to exceed the 20% of the value or of the time of the agreement. So the, and the condition number three, the governmental entity shall have the availability of financial budget. And the fourth condition, a recommendation is issued by the tender committee and approved by the head of the governmental entity, sometimes the minister. And the fifth condition, notify the minister of finance about the committee's recommendation justification and the rate the rate of the amendment so th those five conditions when the uh, governmental entity want to exceed the 20 percent bar of modification on the original contract um, we are still on the uh, the 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 extension of time uh, control uh, so we spoke about first the condition and the prices during the additional period to be the same as the conditions and the prices of the original contract, the 20% bar. Third, that the public interest requires not to launch a new tender. This is very important. The public interest that the governmental entity required to protect not need, requires not to launch a new tender uh, in the same subject. Number four, it is necessary that there is funds are available for the consideration due for the added period. And the last condition, the amendment is an addition during the implementation period and before the maintenance or warranty period. period. So 
in contracting, we know that there is something called maintenance or warranty period is different. Sometimes it's 400 days, sometimes it is 700 days, and sometimes it's 10 years according to the civil 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 law. But the amendment should be within the time frame of the contract, not before it's finished, and we move to the maintenance or warranty period. Article number 81 also mentioned an exemption to that clause, according to which a change order may be made to add a period during the maintenance or guarantee period with the approval of the minister based on recommendation of the tenders and auctions committee. So the government procurement regulatory department at the Ministry of Finance has concluded that the decision to approve the change order may be issued after the end of the original contract period if the relevant department in the entity submits a request for the change order to the committee before the end of the contract period. And this is very important and that the additional period is necessary and unforeseen when determining the original contract period. Those conditions is for the granting the extension of time um, uh, to the to the contractor. I think uh, we have uh, closed uh, the first article. And sorry to go uh, fast because the time is running. Hopefully, we can at least. Uh, grasp, uh, grab some some uh, ideas about the global claim and the construction investment distributes uh, within the time being. So now we will move to the global claim and judicial issue in state of Qatar. What is the global claim? And this question is can be answered and be answered actually by a lot of lawyers here in Doha. Uh, we have received a request from uh, foreign contractors whether the global claim is accepted in Qatari court or not. So that's what made me to present this tonight. The global claim can be defined as a claim where a total sum is put forward as the measure of damages where there are many separate matters of a claim and where it is said to be impractical or impossible to provide breakdown of the sum, breakdown of the sum between those events. A global claim achieved acceptance in common law uh, case which is called Crosby and Sons Letted versus Portland Urban District Council in 1967 in UK, I believe. And there is a string of cases on a global claim. We have another case of Walter Lilly versus Mackay and DMW, and this is apparently a new case, it happened in 2012. So Mr. Justice Akinhead said, what is commonly referred to as a global claim is a contractor's claim which identifies numerous potential or actual causes of delay and or disruption. A total cost on the job, a net payment from the employer and a claim for the balance between cost and payment, which is attributed without more and by interference to the causes of delay and disruption relied upon. However, 
um, he went on a quote of Mr. Justice Donaldson in Crosby, Crosby versus Portland UDC, the case which is very well known in the global claim area, who stated it may well be difficult or even impossible to make an accurate apportionment of the total extra cost between the several causative events. He said, I can see no reason why to, between two brackets, the arbitrator should not recognize the realities of the situation and make individual awards in respect of those parts of individual, individual items of the claim which can be dealt with in isolation and a supplementary award in respect of the reminder of the claim as a whole. So we can see there is two different uh, 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 opinions. Uh, however, if we go to the provisions of the Qatar Civil Code and the global construction claim, we will read the Article 263 of the Civil Law, which relates to the payment of compensation. It states compensation shall, conclude, shall include the loss sustained by the creditor and the profit that he lost provides the same is a natural result of the non-performance or the delay in the performance. Damage shall be deemed a natural result if the creditor was not able to avoid it by exerting reasonable efforts. In Article 211 and 212 of the Procedural Code relate to the evidence and stated the creditor shall prove the existence of liability while the debtor shall disapprove liability thereof. In Clause 212, the statement to be proven shall be relevant to the claim and be produced therein and be acceptable. So it is obvious for me, and I believe that the um, in order to pursue a judge or arbitrator applying the civil code, that the amount of compensation claimed is valid, the claimant must show that it was a natural result of the event giving rise to the claim and couldn't have been avoided by exerting reasonable, reasonable efforts. This requires some level of detail to be given in relation to the compensation claim, including demonstrating that the compensation claim represents a loss, including loss of a profit that was caused by the defendant and the global claim for compensation, therefore may be resisted on the basis that it fails to demonstrate causation. And to be honest with you, in two of the advices I gave, I personally believe that the global claim, if there is a lack of substantiations of the claim itself or the grounds of the claims, it might be rejected by the Qatari court. Um, now we finished from from the, the global claim and we give a snapshot on the global claim and what I'm thinking about the global claim in Qatari jurisdiction. Um, we shall move now to the construction disputes in international investment law. And this is the area that 
I think it is, uh, it will be uh, 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 very good if we have some lawyers and engineers with us tonight. Um, so, so what is the construction disputes in international investment law? I put a statement, a state versus contractor. And this is right. When there is a, an investment case, it means there is a case against a host state. And host state means there is no companies here, there is no employer, there is no governmental entities. It will be referred to the state itself. And as we back to the report that came from the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, it was reporting 22 pending case and 47 concluded construction related investment arbitration disputes. So the first question, what is considered as an investment dispute in construction? Whether a contractor can bring an arbitration against a host state under an international investment agreement often required the consideration of the following question, whether the contractor qualified as an investor, whether the contractor project or the construction contract itself qualified as an investment, whether the contractor claims arise out of the construction contract or are based on breaches of an international investment agreement, and finally, whether the alleged breaches are by the state an emanation of the state or an entity whose conduct is attributable to the state. So those two questions is like a checkbox before we say this is an investment dispute or not. So what is the investment criteria? I put here a very uh, uh, well-known case. It's called Salini versus Morocco case. And in this case, it is about a construction of a highway in Morocco. Identifies the following elements for an activity to qualify as an investment under the exit convention. The first element is substantial commitment or contribution of that investment to the economy of the host state. The second is the participation of that project and the risks of the transaction. The third element is the reasonable duration of performance. The fourth one is the regularity of profit and return of the investment. And the final one is contribution to the development of the host state. So in order that the alleged breach of a contract may constitute a violation under which called the international investment law, it must be the result of the behavior going beyond that which an ordinary contracting party could adopt. Only the state in the exercise of its sovereign authority and not as a contracting party may breach the obligation assumed under the bilateral investment treaties between the host state and the state of the foreign investors. International investment agreements typically provide five main substantive protections relevant to, to, to the con construction and to the contractor and infrastructure distributes. We will name them as no expropriation without compensation fair and equitable treatment to the foreign investor, full and protection and security to the foreign investor. And that means 
that if there is two states and they are, for example, in status of war, the foreign investor shouldn't be harmed because of the political tension between his country and the host state. We have seen some cases when I worked in the exit that the host state start sending some civil troops and militias to sabotage the investment without protecting to the investor. This is against the full protection and security uh, clause. And we have something called non-discrimination. The state should not discriminate the foreign investors based on their nationality, race, religion, and anything else, unless if those discrimination based on reciprocal uh, treatment that the state of the foreign investor did it. I believe that even though the reciprocal treatment is not validated in investment law, this is going to be validated in international norms and relationships, but not in the international investment law. So if I got an investor and he want to claim that there is a discrimination against him, I think he has a valid case, whatever the political tension between his state and the host state. Um, the final one, the observation of ob obligations, or which called the umbrella clause. And we need to stand a little bit about what does it mean, the umbrella clause in investment agreement. Umbrella clause sometimes called elevator or mirror effect clauses. And they are a commitment by the host state to comply with obligations it has entered into with regard to the investment. Umbrella clauses initially emerged in the context of early oil and gas concessions as a means of creating a parallel cause of action under international law for a breach of the contract. In the context of the construction industry, contractors who are contracting directly with the state or its emanation may wish to consider relying on such clauses. It has been said that around 40% of the BITs contain some form of an umbrella, umbrella clause. Such clauses remain controversial, however, as to the nature and the scope of international protection they afford with two competing views taken by arbitral tribunals, umbrella clauses elevate contractual breaches into treaty breaches or umbrella clauses do not elevate purely contractual breaches. Under the first school of thought, Umbrella clauses cannot elevate contractual breaches into treaty breaches by transforming responsibility incurred toward a private investor under a contract into international responsibility. This was the view taken, for example, in SGS versus Pakistan. SGS, a Swiss corporation, commenced an exit arbitration alleging, alleging that Pakistan had breached its obligation under the Pakistan-Switzerland bilateral investment treaty. After Pakistan had initiated a domestic arbitration pursuant to the arbitration clause of the agreement, the tribunal considered whether the existence of the following umbrella clause could transform 
purely contractual claim into BIT claims, which is stated either contracting party shall constantly guarantees and observance the commitment it has entered into with respect to the investment of the investors of the other contracting party. The final clause, which we shall speak before we uh, conclude the session, the fork in the road clause, and in the context of the investment agreement, the fork in the road clause allows an investor to choose between international arbitration and domestic processes of the host state. If the, if the foreign investor choose the domestic court, they cannot therefore thereafter submit a claim to the international arbitration. And the choice of international proceeding precludes a claim to the host state jurisdiction. The most important case on this is called Tutu versus Lebanon case, which is a road construction contract dispute, found that the host state claiming that the action by the foreign investor under the Italy-Lebanon bilateral investment treaty was premature because the national court route agreed in the investment contract had not been exhausted. I, uh, I will finish here because of the other commitments. Hopefully you get benefit from this uh, session and hopefully uh, if you have any questions, you can send it to my email, which is following this slide. I wish the best of the rest of this year and to all of the Nawik community, the attendees, and the people of Qatar and the worldwide to get over the COVID-19. And thank you, Billy, the floor is yours. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dr. Nasser. Um, just before before uh, we let you go, we understand that you're very busy, so we we appreciate uh, your time. Uh, and I just want to thank you again for um, your support to NEWIC, for uh, dedicating your time to us, uh, and for this insightful uh, presentation. So uh, thank you so much, Dr. Nasser, again, and um, and to our attendees, um, as uh, Dr. Nasser said, uh, he will respond to your questions. We did have a number of questions, and um, um, we will um, uh, the ones that uh, have arrived to us, we will pass them to Dr. Nasser for for the response, and we will um, we will distribute uh, them accordingly. Uh, and of course, uh, I would like to present the. Uh, the appreciation certificate to Dr. Nasser for um, for his uh, session to, tonight. Um, uh, the the session has been, um, I suppose, introduced some things that um, you know they are they are very new to us. Uh, and again, you know, it's privileged to have Dr. Nasser um, with us and um, answer to your questions. So um, uh, please um, send them uh, either to info at nevic.qa uh, uh, or directly to uh, Dr. Nasser's email. Um, Again, you know, the session was great. Thank you so much, Dr. Nasser. Thank you to all of our attendees for joining us tonight. Um, we will have another session on uh, on uh, uh, the, sim the same subject, um, construction claims and, um, and extension of time, um, uh, especially related to force majeure and COVID-19. Um, so uh, please stay tuned for for the time uh, and uh, date. Um, otherwise, um, all of you have a good evening. Uh, thank you so much. And um, and again, Dr. Nasser, it was an absolute privilege to have have you with us. Thank you, Billy. Thanks indeed.
my pleasure. Thank you. Good night, everyone.